This is the Straight Out of BS podcast. This is Jordan. This is Cami, part two. And uh, yeah, um, if anybody wants to be interviewed, email me at uh, straight out of BS podcast at gmail.com. And we're almost at a thousand views, so keep it up. I'm pumped. Like a week ago, we were at like 500, and now we're almost at a thousand. So we're getting there. We're getting it done. So good job, guys. Keep it up. And with that being said, uh, yeah, you can take off wherever you want to take off from yesterday. Okay, cool. Yeah, I I actually took some notes of like what I wanted to talk about, but I lost them. So <laughs> of course. I don't know if I can blame that on CPTSD, but might as well. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, just like- I know the the first <laughs> thing that I put. <laughs> I, I like to blame whatever I can on it. No, I'm, I'm totally kidding. I was just talking about, you know, that the message that your uh, that your old staff wrote you. Oh, yeah. He's like, why are you guys yeah. still want to whine about this? It was so long ago. Anyway. Yeah, um, probably what was I going to say? Huh? It sounds like he was on drugs or something. Like, that sounds like something somebody on drugs or, like, with mental health problems would say. Or, yeah, like, unaddressed mental health problems because, like, anybody who's actually, like, swam in any depth of, like, like their, you know, their psyche or whatever understands that the things that happen to you when you're a kid and the things that happen to you when you're a teenager, they will absolutely affect you for the rest of your life. Like, it's the way your brain is wired, right? So Not only that, but, bro, you work there. What are you going to tell me that it's not fucking, like, get over it, da-da-da-da. It's like, bro, you work there. You saw what happened. What are you talking about? Like, but in denial. Them, I think it was totally different. Like, I, I have worked, and people might hate me for this. I hope not. But I've worked at three different programs for kids, um, all of which were way, like, so much kinder to the kids, in my opinion. Maybe the kids would disagree, but they did not have attack therapy. They didn't have any of that. But like for me, as a staff, the experience wasn't traumatizing at all. It was awesome. I went to work. I loved the kids. I loved my job. And then I went home, you know, yeah. and it wasn't traumatizing at all. So I think a lot of the staff, when you're like, dude, that like the way it feels to us, we were filled with anxiety. We were filled with cortisol and just like all the worst, you know, neurochemicals. We were like bathed in them all the time. But for the staff, it wasn't like that. It was just like, oh, got to go to work. Okay, now I get to go home, like watch TV. It wasn't like they were trying to earn points and fighting for their freedom, you know? So totally different experience for them and and I can believe that a lot of them go oh why why are these kids whining we were so nice to them but yeah they didn't have the experience of what it's like to be there unwillingly and to not yeah. know when you're going to go home yeah yeah but what's crazy about him is that he actually went I, be, I I'm I'm not like 100% sure about this but I'm pretty sure that he went there as like a teenager and then he started working there so it's yeah. like, oh. yeah, so it's, even, so it's even worse. It's like, bro, you Wait, don't okay. there, but you fucking then became a staff and you still saying that this shit, like, really? If he was a staff when you were there, yeah, he might have been, like, in the program when I was in the program. Well, I'm, yeah, he, he was there, like, a lot earlier uh, from when I, I went there, obviously, because I was there right before it shut close to when it shut down or whatnot but when you were there yeah that's around more of the time he probably would have been there it, yeah i don't really yeah. want to drop his name i don't want to drop his name if, if you've seen the comments online then you know who he is but i'm not trying to i'm not gonna be that much of a dick yeah I'm not gonna yeah you know like, no, i don't mind saying he's entitled to his name. own opinion. he's entitled to his opinion you know what i mean i'm, I'm yeah not, i just don't agree with it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. Well, and that's the other thing, like, if you were a student there and then you worked there, you might just kind of think, well, that's how people are supposed to be treated. But, like, I was a student there and then I worked in another program. And just to give you an example, well, I already told you, first of all, they're like, Kenny, you can't give somebody a consequence in their first week. They don't understand the rules yet. Yeah. Um, and, and they're like, you have to, like, teach them the rules and everything. But another thing that happened was one of the girls, we went on an outing to the beach and I was like, oh my gosh, these girls are so lucky they get to go to the beach. And we were getting out of the van 
And I told one of the girls, I'm like, oh, could you lock the door? And she goes, no, you know, she's a teenager, right? Like, yeah. and I'm like, dude, lock the door. Cause I told you to, I'm the staff. Like in Spring Creek, we were so scared all the time that it like, if a staff told you to do something, it was like, oh my gosh, what a privilege. Yes, of course I will help you. Like, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to do something to please the staff, you know? And yeah. so I was just like shocked. And I'm like, dude, I'm like, lock the door. Like, and the other staff pulled me aside and she's like, Cammy, that girl has her autonomy. She doesn't have to do what you tell her to do. That is her choice. Like, you can't even get mad at her. Like, you're, you're really, the way you're thinking about these kids is all wrong. Like, I learned so much from working there. And I learned, wow, the way we were treated was really screwed up. Yeah. yeah so, I, mean, I, don't I don't know. Anyway, um, you know, I remember the first thing that was on my list was babysitting. Okay. Um because I babysat for who? For, babysitting for who? I babysat Cameron's kid, who okay. actually wasn't his biological son, um, but I didn't find that out till later. Uh, I babysat his kid like three, four times a week. I'm not even kidding. Because I had, um, you know how you were supposed to take a certain number of tests uh, every week at school. So I took a bunch of tests and I would finish like really early. And so what they they'd come in and they'd be like, okay, who's done with all of their tests this week? And I'd be like, I am. And so they'd be like, okay, Cammie, you're babysitting. So I babysat all, all the time. I was in Cameron's house alone with his child, like several days a week. Um, and there were cigarettes in there. There was alcohol in there. There was beer. There was a phone. I could have made phone calls, but like he trusted me. He knew that I wasn't going to do anything bad you know, cause I was all like brainwashed or whatever. Um, and it, it's just crazy to me that like, first of all, my parents are paying you like a, well, my grandparents in my case, a ridiculous amount of money to have me here. And, and second, like you trust me to take care of like your most precious, you know, your child, um, and be in your house with all this, you know, contraband stuff, but you don't, you're not going to let me go home. You know, like, I don't know. It was just kind of messed up. But at the time, it got me out of the normal schedule. And so I was, like, super thrilled, super excited, and really, really grateful for, you know, that, that I got to do that. How long would he have you babysitting the kids when you, when you do that? Like, how long would you be away from the family for? Uh, a couple hours every day. I, yeah. I'm I'm not sure. I mean, I think it varied, but probably longer than an hour, less than five or six hours. But I was with that kid a lot. Um, I loved that kid, man. I love that kid. I babysat Chase and son a couple of times too, but I think like he and his wife were maybe like, oh, maybe we don't want these kids babysitting our son. And then, um, Chafin's wife had another baby and a, a little girl, and then Cameron's wife had a little girl. And I never really babysat the little girl because by then I was on the upper levels and, you know, I was like working at the program. So I didn't babysit anymore. But yeah, I babysat all the time when I was, I think it was mostly when I was level three. Okay. It was nice. <laughs> I felt normal for a little while, you know. Yeah. Um, but I was going to ask you, because last time you asked me, and I, um, I don't think I answered this, but like you asked what was the worst thing that I saw in the program. So I, I actually oh, yeah. wanted to know what was the worst. Yeah. What, what was the worst thing that you saw? Uh, shit. I don't really like, there's a lot of shit. Um, I mean, the thing that I personally experienced, I spent four days in intervention one time. Mm. For straight days. Yeah. And, yeah, that was fucking horrible. Like, I, I didn't, like, I literally, I was in there four days, right? And I felt like I was in there, like, in a couple hours. Like, Dude. that's fucked my fucking distortion of time was. I thought I'd been yeah. in there maybe max, like, a day, maybe. And I've been in there, like, four days. So that was pretty fucking crazy. Um, it was, dude, we didn't call it intervention. We called it The Hobbit. Maybe we called it ISO, but I think we mostly just called it The Hobbit. But, like, 
I, as a junior staff, I worked in there a lot and uh, you could just see the kids' mental health just go downhill. It, it was crazy. Like day one, they were coherent, could look you in the eye, could talk to you, blah, blah, blah. And several days in, it was just like, they'd get weird. Yeah. That was and that's, it. It's crazy. Like for people that don't know, like solitary confinement is something that even in jails and prisons, they don't, they, they kind of frown upon, like they still do it. But it's super frowned upon. Like a lot of people don't like think it's inhumane and shit for adults. We're not, and we're talking, they were doing this to us as teenagers. We're talking about for adults, a lot of people yeah. looked out. So for them to be doing that to teenagers and when their mind is developing and shit, like that's why it's just so crucial. And why it's so, I don't know, I personally can attest that shit's terrifying. No, it's horrible. I didn't think they were ever going to let me out of there. I honestly didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, when I went through, I think it was accountability when I tried to go through the first time. Um, do you know which seminar? Maybe it was different for you guys, but like there was a seminar where you started out. Um, and I think the first one of the first activities was you had to give yourself a rating from like zero to 100 percent. And it was supposed to represent like the how good you were doing in your program and the amount of effort you were like putting forward in your program and stuff. And I don't know how everybody else got the memo. because <laughs> like, I rated myself 75% and I thought, you know, cause everybody can improve, like nobody's perfect. And so yeah. I, I think I was on level four at the time. Um, and I rated myself 75% and everybody else rated themselves 85% and above. And I, it was Dwayne who was running the seminar and so, because I rated myself low, they just, you know, he had them surround me and do toe-to-toe -to -toe feedback for, it felt like a very, very, very long time. Um, and then, you know, he told me, well, you chose out of this seminar, which, yeah, I didn't choose out. You chose me out. Thank you very much. But um, so after that, they sent me to a room alone. Um, and again, they knew I wasn't going to do anything bad. You know what I mean? So I was in a room alone. The window was covered. <laughs> there was nothing in there. I just had to sit, you know. Um, was it then... Huh? Mm, was it, it was a different. I'm trying to remember which. It might have been in the upstairs of the old girl's cabin, which was before those other cabins were built. I think. Because I seem to remember it being upstairs, but I couldn't see out the window or anything, you know. Um, and so it's like weird because I can't remember which building I was in. But I do remember that every couple of hours that first day, they would come back and grab me and put me back in the seminar. And everybody would circle up and give me, you know, toe to toe feedback again. And that happened like four times in one day. And I don't like, I don't know what it was like for you, but definitely like the attack therapy um, for me was just like, I was already such a sensitive kid. Yeah. You know what I mean? That, that was really, really, really damaging. I think um, I like, I was already in my own head constantly especially as the program went on I was constantly criticizing myself so to have a bunch of people circle up and publicly criticizing me was you know and screaming like screaming in my face for like 20 minutes half hour was just really really bad <laughs> really bad for me so but so they kept doing that they kept bringing me back in the seminar and reaming me you know and then they'd send me back to that room alone and then bring me back in and send me back to the room alone and and so on and so forth like and you don't know when they're coming for you so that's like a real kind of torture and you're totally alone with your thoughts which fine i liked being alone so because like i still like being alone because people are dangerous you know like people can hurt me anyway so so then and that night, um, you know, I could see around because there was paper blocking the window, but I could see around the edges that the sun was going down. And it was weird because I was like, gosh, like dinner is over and they mm -hmm. haven't come to get me for dinner. And then like the sun was all the way down 
and I had no bed, I had no blanket, I had no pillow, I had my seminar binder, and that's it. And um, they had forgotten about me, like they didn't know, or I guess they, yeah, they just forgot about me. So I spent the night in there, and the only thing in there was a little plastic trash can. And um, so I had to like pee in there, you know what I mean? And I was like, I don't know what else to do, you know? Um, and, and it was cold. It was, um, there was snow on the ground. And so I was shivering all night. Like I was super cold um, and I had nothing but, you know, my seminar binder. And that night I seriously, like I, I've never gotten that close um, any other time in my life to, uh, you know, to wanting to kill myself. Like, uh, um, like I thought about that plastic trash can, like I thought maybe I could rip it apart and that maybe it would be sharp enough to cut my wrists, you know? Um, I thought about like my seminar binder, I thought about opening the little rings and jamming my wrist down on it and ripping it. Um, like I, <laughs> I seriously, after a day of just being brought back and forth, back and forth, um, and having everybody, you know, that I admired on the facility just screaming in my face, like, I seriously wanted to die. Anyway, the next morning, um, I'm still in there because they totally forgot about me. Like nobody, I don't, I don't know what happened, but I was in there overnight with nothing. Um, but Cameron burst in like in the morning, he's like, oh my God, are you okay? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm Okay. But it was so funny because I could tell that, like, in the beginning, he was really worried. I think they were worried that I was going to kill myself because they knew that I was pretty, you know, that was a rough day. I was on the edge anyway. Um, so I think when he saw that I was alive, he was really relieved. But I think he was also relieved because he knew that I was the kind of student who was never going to tell anybody about this, you know. And that was definitely something that that legally they can't leave you without dinner. They can't leave you without a bed. They can't leave you without blankets in the middle of the winter. They can't, you know, all of those things. It was definitely legally something that if I had told my parents or a lawyer, they would have gotten in trouble. But I think he was like super relieved because he knew that I was like so thoroughly under the spell of the program that I would never do anything like that. Anyway, at, but of course I was thinking like, Jesus, like this is so messed up. So then he leaves and then Dwayne comes in and Dwayne, the Dwayne Smotherman, the facilitator, yeah. he's such an asshole. He just like stood over me and you could tell that his goal was ever? kind of like, huh? Go ahead. Well, first of all, he was totally alone with me. And this is the same guy who my previous seminar had said, <laughs> if I met you on the street, you would be doing whatever I told you to do. And you know, even then, even then, when I was like super like brainwashed, I was like, no, I wouldn't. But like, if, sorry, my dog just came in. She's so cute. You're so cute. You want to see my dog? Sure. Oh, Bobby. She's the best. She's the best. Okay, happy dog. Anyway. Yeah, I love like her. Um, so, so yeah. So hold on. I'm going to close the door. <clears throat> So, um, so they, so I'm alone with this guy and he's like standing over me and you could see, first of all, he brought in a chair and he's sitting on a chair and I'm sitting on the same, you know, carpet that I had slept on. Hi pup. And, um, and he, he like, his whole goal was to make sure that I knew that I deserved what I had gotten both the previous day and that night that like me being in there without food and without a blanket and everything was like you deserve that, you know, because you rated yourself 75%. Like, I don't know. It, like, it was just, it was just so clearly like he was trying to manipulate me, you know? Anyway, that was, that was my one experience with isolation, which was not four days. It was one night, but I can see how like somebody's mental health just plummets in that situation. Yeah. It sucks. And to answer your question, I went through orientation, discovery, focus, principles, keys to being in relationships, key, keys to dreams, PC1, PC2, PC3, and PC4. Dang. You guys had a lot of seminars. Well, there we was, there's, actually like, there's 
uh, it was orientation, discovery, focus, principles, keys to being in relationships, uh, keys to dreams, and then all the PCs, which goes up, there's four PCs. Jane and Lou and David Gilchrist, it looks like they just needed some more money. They had to like invent some more seminars for you guys. Yeah, there's like seven or eight different keys. And they for the keys seminars, you would randomly get picked whichever one you go to every month. So they just pick a random one for you to go to. So you could go to the same one twice. They pick Wait, once a month? How often did you go through seminars? Or, no, no, no. However long uh, in between seminars. I can't remember. I thought it was a month. Okay. But. Yeah, I think ours came in every every couple of months. Yeah, it could be that. I can't. I really can't remember that how well. But yeah, all we had was discovery, focus, accountability, keys, and then PC one, PC two. Damn. Yeah, they added a bunch of seminars then. I'm sorry. <laughs> like yeah. some of the worst times, man. Like they would still make us eat eighty percent of our food, and so many people would. Just like not so many people, but enough people would just like eat 80% of their food and then throw up, you know, like that was how much tension and stress people were under during the seminars. Like they couldn't keep food down. Yeah, it was crazy. Do you Did remember they keep you guys up most of the night too? Uh, I think so. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. On seminar, yeah, it was on seminar nights, it was like, yeah. You like lose track of time in that fucking seminar building. Oh, yeah. No, like you get in there and it would be, you know, like morning and then you get out and it would be like late at night and you'd be like, whoa, what happened? I just remember the entire seminar, my whole body would ache, like my face would ache and my whole body, it would just feel like puffy and like achy and weird. I don't know if that was like stress or what, but. Yeah, what they're, really what they're doing in the seminar is releasing psycho-emotional energy. And when psycho-emotional energy is released from the body, it can have all sorts of fucking crazy-ass effects. Like, you can have a full-fledged, like, uh, um, like, hallucinogenic experience, too. Your body can naturally make you hallucinate if you're releasing yeah. emotional energy. It's been proven. Like, So that's what they're doing in there is they're brainwashing us and fucking releasing a lot of fucking psycho emotional energy from people. Yeah. That's what the whole release you know, process is about, is releasing that all was that. That's what was about? The release process with the towels. They're trying to yeah. release psycho emotional energy as they can out. So you feel like literally you, you feel completely drained, but then they like try and cause I've, cause I've investigated like the, the psychology behind it. So they, they break you down and rip you apart. Right. And then they build you up back in a specific way. So that's why when you come out of a seminar, you feel, like, at least I felt like I was on crack. Like, that's something I could compare. Yeah, oh, you feel like, weird. I was on, like, I was on top of the world. Like, the only thing I can compare it to is, like, a heroin high or, like, high on drugs or whatever. Like, because you you literally feel high because you've released so much of that psycho-emotional energy and all that, like, that guilt and whatever the fuck you were holding on to. They're trying to make us release that shit in the seminar. That was the point of the seminar. But the way they went about it, I don't agree with yeah, I I mean, I think that like things like that can be really powerful and really good, but I think it's mostly really powerful and good if you've opted in, if you've chosen yeah. to be there because you want to be there and putting it in that context. Like, it's funny because I've tried to explain the program to people and a lot of times, well, for example, my sister <laughs> Like I told her about like Trail of Lights and, and the gravel pit. Did you guys see the gravel pit? Uh, that? I mean, we when I was there, we played football in it. Um, oh, yeah, no. Like when it was snowy and shit, <laughs> but I, I've heard about something about the gravel pit, like how they had people uh, like doing laps or something. Well, I, I wrote a long, like very detailed description of it. Did I tell you that? I, I didn't tell you this. So in 2015, I went to the campus um, because I'd heard that our records were there in an unlocked building. And then I heard that they got burned, but I thought maybe they were lying. I thought maybe they hadn't burned them. So I went to the campus and I didn't know, you know, I thought maybe it had new owners because there were people on the campus and I didn't want to upset them. You know, I didn't want to like... <laughs> I actually talked to one guy, he saw me. And so I went to go talk to him and 
And he was like, uh, yeah, there used to be a uh, school here. And the way he was talking about it, I could tell that other people had come back and that they were pissed. So I was trying to be really nice and not really let on like who I was. Anyway, though, um, that night I slept in the gravel pit, like in my, uh, my van. <laughs> and there was one of those, did you ever have like those crazy purple light storms while you're in the program? It was like one of my favorite things about Montana was these crazy purple lightning storms. And before I got to the campus, because I couldn't find it for a while, but then I found it. And I was like, I was like, it'd be so crazy if we had one of those lightning storms tonight. Like that would be like the, the campus, like welcoming me back. And but the sky was totally clear. So I was like, OK, it's not going to happen that night. There was the craziest purple lightning storm. And so um, I actually recorded some video while I was there and I just like remembered my nights in the gravel pit. And so, so then later I wrote, like I wrote a really long story about it. So um, that's the one I was talking about, maybe reading for your, for your podcast, because yeah. it just describes like what it was really like to be totally powerless there. Yeah. I was going to say at the end of this, I want you to read it if you if you don't mind. It's so long. <laughs> I don't care. 30 minutes long it's really long like you might get very bored if you just sat here and listened to me read it but um but I I mean if you want me to like I totally will I might have to take a couple of breaks though because like my throat um but yeah yeah. yeah I mean it's your story so I want you to get it in there but um I was yeah. gonna say also that I'm honestly like, if I ever go to the campus, I honestly want to do some ghost hunting there because I feel like, like, like check it out. You, if you go, like, you know how like old like buildings and whatnot have, you know, a bunch of energy still there. Okay. What were you just talking about? The releasing of all that, the massive amount of psychoemotional energy. Dude, there's gotta be some shit there, bro. There's gotta yeah. be some fucking rip, like. We can get like those ghostbusters, like deep, 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 like yeah, some kind of machine to pick some stuff. shit. I'd be really the funny. ghost of our former selves, because Something. like we died there Something. and we like came back as somebody else. Well, also, there's been a lot of people. There's been a couple of people uh, that have killed themselves in the program. At least one. Yeah, Carly. So I mean. I'm, I just, I don't know. Some people th- might think that that's, oh, you shouldn't do that. That's like disrespectful or whatever. But I just, all I'm saying is that it would be interesting to see what kind of energy is up there because of all the yeah. neg- negative stuff that went on there. Well, I have to say it was really empowering. So I like, what, I actually bought, I don't know if I should say this legally, but I didn't use them, but I bought a, a pair of three foot bolt cutters. I was like, I'm finding my records, man. Um, but <laughs> I didn't actually use them because most of the buildings were unlocked. Um, and I, I mean, hopefully I won't get in trouble. I didn't destroy anything, you know, but I, I wanted to go see if our records were there. And I, I think that's justice, you know, like, like anyway, though, I tried not to bother anybody, but I walked through all the buildings that were open. Um, yeah, uh, it was crazy. It was when crazy. Was I had memories. Huh? When, when was this? I think it was uh, September 8th, uh, 2016, actually. Um, the, the videos have the date on them. So, ow, baby. My dog, my dog's in a very nibbly phase. She's like, she just constantly wants to be nibbling on my skin. Baby, stop it. Okay, that's my toe. She's so cute, though. Um, yeah, so it was like I had just gotten back from Taiwan, um, and I went up there. <sighs> Yeah. I was, I was going to ask, was there a lower facility or like, you know, where the seminar building is, right? Was there like, were they making use of the other cabins down on the lower like part down there? Or did you yeah. know about that? What, what were they using? The, that girls, the girls cabin was down there. Okay. So like you drive in, right. And there's the green and white sign on the right. Yeah, yeah. And then you keep going. When I got there, there wasn't, baby, what are you chewing on? Stop it. Um, there wasn't uh, the seminar facility or the seminar, the big like uh, warehouse kind of thing. Yeah. They hadn't yeah. built that yet when I got there, but that's on the left, right? And then yeah. you keep driving and then there's the first cabin on the right. That was the girl's cabin. That's where Destiny family lived. Oh, okay. Okay. So they yeah. weren't making use of the, really of the top part yet. 
when you were there? Um, no, the boys lived up on the top. Oh, okay. Like oh, near okay. the admin and the hungry horse. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then so they and then in between they built those big those big old buildings. Um, and then Cameron's house was down the road a little further. Like if you went there was the admin building, then you went down this road and his house was on the left. And then um, the junior staff girls actually lived in a little kind of like cabin thing next to Cameron's house for, we did lived it, there for a while. Did it have a track going around it? A track? Like a, it was like, behind... like a track you'd walk on? Like... No, I don't think we had that. It was behind the basketball courts. That's where Cameron's house was. Okay. Did have they you, have the dog Jake when you were there? The big German that, Shepherd Jake? Not that I know of. Oh, yeah. They had a dog named Jake. Like one of the only dogs I've ever met that hasn't liked me. <laughs> um, he would bark at all of us. That dog like hated us kids. <laughs> um, yeah. How did we get on that? I can't remember, but. Mm. Uh, oh, oh yeah what I was saying like with the gravel pit and the trail of lights like I told my sister about it and she's like well Cammy, some people pay for those kind of experiences like she's like it's like a ropes course or you know and I'm like no like it's totally different when you have to be there and the way you perform tells you when you get to go home you know yeah. like it's a totally different experience it's like the difference between what was that Korean show, that crazy Korean show on Netflix where, like, everybody's oh, dying? Uh, Squid Game? Yeah, it's like Squid Games versus, like, American Gladiator or whatever, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Very different feeling. <laughs> I was going to yeah. ask, what was your lowest and highest point in the program if you have the highest point no Lilith this isn't for you um I think the lowest point was definitely that experience when I when they forgot about me and I was you know wanting to kill myself in that room alone with the windows taped over and had to use the bathroom in a little plastic trash can I think that was probably my lowest Oh, but I had another low point. The staff made me sit in a in a cold puddle, and then they dumped buckets of cold water over my head. I don't know why. <laughs> yes. I'm not sure what I was supposed to learn from that experience, because I don't think I learned anything except for how, like, horrible humans could be. Um, You're supposed my... to learn how to not get wet when they dump water on you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, here's what they did, dude. So, like, they dump, like, four buckets of water over my head, and I'm sitting, it's, like, October in Montana, it's super cold, right, and I'm just sitting there shivering, and they're, like, because they, like, told me to sit in the puddle, so I sat, and then they dump water over my head, so, and then the staff were, like, why did you let us do that to you? See? Why did you let us do that, Cammy? This is, a, this is, your self-esteem is so low, you just let us dump water. I'm, like, Dude, I have to do everything you tell me to do. I don't have a choice. Are you crazy? Like, I'm supposed to say no to anything you ask me to do? So that was, I mean, that wasn't my lowest point, but it was pretty crappy. Um, but I think another low point was the gravel pit night, which I'll, I'll read that story and then you'll, you'll understand that. Um, but, you know, I did. I guess I had highs, but, like, I was so, I just think I was, so by the end, I was so mentally unhealthy. I was just like so anxious and so messed up after a year and a half of this that I like girls. I mean, this sucks because I can't I can't remember a lot of the lower level girls when I was an upper level. And several have written to me and been like, Cammy, you were so happy all the time. They're like, you were always smiling. And I am a smiler for sure. But I also know that that's like pleasing to the people in charge if you seem like a happy camper. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, that might also be why I was really smiley and everything. Um, I, I didn't really experience the highs in the seminars because I felt like I was like, okay, you tore us down for two days or three days in some cases. 
and then I'm supposed to feel on top of the world on the third day. Like you told me I'm a complete piece of shit for two or three days straight. I mean, just pummeled me as much as you could. And then on the third day, you're like, no, just kidding. You're great. And I'm supposed to believe that. So I didn't really experience the highs the way some people say they did in the seminars. I, I still I still like my contract, you know, I still that's true because I chose that for myself. Um, some of my relationships were good. Like, I'm glad that I met some of the people I met. I, some of the staff, I'm grateful, you know, that they were in my life. Um, going home was a huge high. <laughs> of course. I mean, babysitting, babysitting that little kid. I won't say his name, but um, that I was really, you know, I loved that kid. I was really connected to him. One time, Cameron let me wander out into the woods alone. And that was like my jam, dude. It still is like my happiest place on earth is just hiking with my dog alone in the middle of the mountains with nobody, nobody for miles. And so Cameron once let me just walk into the woods by myself and I got to stay out there for like an hour. And that was probably the highest high in the program. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about you? What was, did you have highs there? Did you have good times? Uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a, quite a few good times actually. Um, just, uh, tame a few, just, uh, being able to just coach people when I got on upper levels and, uh, like there was this one kid who was, uh, I'm not going to say his name. Um, those of you who are watching this video and are in my family, all I'll say is that he was Russian and he got picked on a lot. Mm -hmm his accent and just he was straight up because of his accent people would like mimic like mock him and shit and just pick on him and shit like that and fucking so when i got in the upper levels i realized that like oh shit yeah this sucks and like it, I, i'm essentially i'm a cop essentially but yeah what kind yeah. of cop do i want to be you know what i mean so i was like i'm just i'd rather like so I took like certain people under my wing that got picked on i'd just be like nah that's not gonna fly when i'm fucking on shift and you can ask, you, you know, man. I've had people reach out to me and just like just the other night, um, a, a guy that I'm going to have on the podcast, <clears throat> he's reaching out to me and he, he'd gotten upset because he thought that I was blowing him off and whatnot. And I've, I've just been hella busy with the podcast and shit. And so he was he's messaging me the other night and fucking dude, he, just like people when, that have been in the program with you kind of know how to push your buttons and shit. And he's just sitting there fucking pushing my buttons and fucking, dude, he got me, he got me pretty, like, he almost got me to, like, flip my lid at, on him. And so mm -hmm. I called him and I was like, bro, like, what the fuck are you doing? Da -da 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 -da. And he's like, bro, I just wanted to talk to you, like, literally, like, you in the program, like, you're yeah. the one person that, like, had my back and fucking, like, didn't fucking give me a bunch of shit when you worked the family and, like, was always cool towards me. Yeah. I was like, shit, man, why didn't you just say that from the start? Why did you have to fucking, like, push my buttons and shit? And he's like, because I wanted to get your attention. And I'm like, well, well it fucking worked. But damn, bro, like, he can't be doing that shit. I was like, I'm not ignoring you. Like, you'll be on the podcast and shit. But, yeah, it's just, like, people reaching out to me like that. Like, because I've had several people reach out to me. And then, like, you know, because I want to genuinely know if they've had this same experience and they, they feel the same way. Cause I feel like I, I did good and like coached people and was able to help people out in the program. Um, but I want to hear it from other people. Cause like one of the most rewarding things for me in the program was being able to like, and a lot of people like, excuse me, but a lot of people that have been through the staffs and seminars might not agree with me, but I took the same approach when I was in seminars. I'd be like, look, like I wouldn't like, when they'd have you yell um, profanities or whatever, like during the release process, I'd go around and I'd actually coach them and sell them like motivational shit instead of the fucking like Aww. tearing them down shit. Cause like, I know what yeah. the fuck, like, they were trying to do. Like once I went through the seminars, I knew I got what they were trying to do and the message they were trying to do. So I was like, I'm just going to spit it in a different way to them. And just yeah. like, so I've had like, like literally on my seminar binder right here, like every single one of these dots, was given like there's like a fuckload down here too every single one of these dots was like somebody that had come up to me individually in a seminar and been like you changed my life or like you helped me get through some shit now i know who i am da -da 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 -da. <clears throat> so i've just that was super rewarding just
just like the relationships I had in the families. I dropped into every single lower level family. I was in honor. I, I, I came there in honor family. Um, I went to respect or dropped into respect, dropped into quest, dropped into Genesis. Then I got in the upper levels. I was in dream family. Um, so I was in a lot of different families and I, I, so I gained a lot of different relationships and stuff with people. And, uh, so, so just the relationships I had with people, it was a really shitty place, but some of the conversations that I had with my closest friends there, like at nighttime when the night staff, cause the night staff used to let like some of us, like if they were a chill night staff had let you come off your bunk and like, so I'd go over to my homie's bunk and just yeah, like, we did not have and, like, chopping it up and, like, like that. Yeah, write, no. write lyri writing lyrics in the journal and, like, singing to each other, whatever the fuck, like, so shit like that, like, and just, like, <clears throat> like, to this day, like, it's hard to find people that you can get that close to in real life, and it's just, like... You know, yeah, um, I think that is something, like, the depth of the relationships. I'll tell you, there's actually two other places where I have found that. One is with expats, like when you're living in another country and you like, you're just in such weird circumstances that you tend to get really close to people really fast. And the other one is like the van life community. Cause I'm, I'm visiting my mom right now, but I actually live in a van, which I do think is in a very real way, a result of my trauma, but that lifestyle really works for me. Like it's, and the community that I found there is incredible. Like, honestly, I recommend it especially to people who have serious trauma like um for example like I know a girl who has agoraphobia and she would like stayed in her house for 11 years she couldn't leave her house but then she moved into a van she lost her what's it called like a uh, her benefits or whatever like her government benefits or whatever so what are you eating okay you can eat that um <laughs> So, and so like she moved into a van and suddenly she could leave the house again. Cause she knew like, she's like, my house is right outside so I can go anywhere. And it just was like really, really good for her life. And also, I don't, I don't know if you have this problem, but like to me, groups of people just feel really, really dangerous. Like I'm I can't always hold a job for that. that reason. I can't hold like, yeah, I get fired a lot of the time for my job just cause I I'll flip my lid. If too many people get around me, like, my social anxiety would just be like, boom. And I'll just like, I'll walk off the job. Like I can't do it a lot of the time. Yeah. I just can't. Yeah. Like mine's, mine's different than that. Mine's kind of like a slow burn, but I just like, I can't tolerate it. Like the, the feel, I, I just feel like the other shoe was always going to drop and yeah. they're going to circle up and they're going to give me feedback. I wouldn't have put it that way for a lot of years. Like I would have just been like, I don't know, something's wrong with me. Like I can't. So I'm really lucky because I've been working remotely for over a decade and I, I just have the perfect gig and I can work from anywhere and it's amazing and I work whenever I want and everything like that. But um, but yeah, like I when I was listening to other people who you were interviewing and you guys were like, yeah, we can't hold like a normal job. I'm like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> like me, too. It sucks. Yeah. You know, but I, I love my work. So I'm really, really grateful for that. Uh, but it it's a struggle, even groups of friends, like even groups of friends, like I will be there, but I need to be able to flee at any second. And so like, I call my, my van, my escape pod, when things get a little, when I get kind of, and my friend, like I have a good friend who she'll see me. She's like, Cammy, you're doing that thing where, where I just like implode, like I just withdraw. And that's when I know I need to go off and be alone. Because to me, alone is the safest place I can be. You know, it's other people who mess, like, and I, I do, I think that's a direct result of the program. Like, situations where other people get a lot of meaning and a lot of, like, support and love in their lives are, like, intolerable to me. Like, I can't relation, you know, I, I have a lot of friends and I, I have good relationships with my family, but I need to be able to escape at any moment if I am feeling because like, I think because of that experience in the program, my, I feel like when I'm with people, I have to please them. I have to be what they want me to be because that's what I had to do in the program. It like reordered my entire social way of being. And so like being around other people for me is really exhausting because I'm trying so hard to like be what they want me to be. And then when I get away, I can be alone and then I'm cool, you know, but things like having a roommate, 
I could not do it. I haven't had a roommate since like 2005, you know, um, like being in a relationship, having somebody live with me. I've had a lot of boyfriends who wanted to, you know, take things a little deeper, or, you know, whatever. And I, I just can't, I, I can't have somebody in my space all the time because I, I just don't, I do not relax around other people. And I, I do, I think it's a direct result of the program. Also, you weren't allowed to leave in the program. Yeah. Like yeah. Harder. And getting stuck for me is like the most terrifying. Like I almost want to get it, get my hands on one of those, you know, suicide pills, because if anybody ever locked me up again, I'd be like, cool, I'm out. Like this is not happening. Yeah. And that's also, I think why I've kept myself like totally, like I don't break the, I've gotten like one traffic ticket since I got out of the program. Like I don't, I don't do anything illegal <laughs> that I can get in trouble for. Cause I just, I'm too terrified of being locked up. I can't <laughs> stand the thought of it. For sure. For sure. I definitely agree with that. Um, so yeah. if you, do you have anything else you want to add to your story before you read your poem? Or um, you it's, not, it's, it's like a freaking oh. epic. No, oh, oh, wait, I have one more question. Knowing what yeah. you know now, do you feel, is it your feeling that these places should or even could be fully regulated or do you think they should all be just be shut down? Man, I don't know. It's that's such a hard question to answer. I have not experienced all programs. I believe that some of them are probably doing some good. Some of the ones I've worked at, the staff genuinely respected